Thanks everyone for coming. I'm just here to kick it off really quick. My name is Lisa. I am a volunteer for uh, Carter's campaign. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here supporting my friend who I think will be such a great city councilor. But um, as a non-Ward 3 resident, I'm gonna hand it over to a few, or, or sorry, Ward 1 resident. I'm gonna hand it over to a few Ward 1 uh, folks so that way they can tell you about uh, why they think Carter is the right person to be your next city councilor. So I'd like to introduce Cindy Wolkin uh, as our first speaker. I was disappointed to hear that Zariah will not run again, but thrilled that Carter is stepping up, truly. I cannot think of a better candidate for numerous reasons. His consistent progressive values, hard work, compassion, and pragmatism. He has shown this through his steadfast political work, recognizing the importance of taking a stand and being involved. He is thoughtful and open-minded, dedicated to work collaboratively, traits that are fundamental to help repair the rift we see in our community, and for working productively with others committed to improving the lives of our neighbors and making Burlington a safer and more livable city. I'm sure all of you here and most residents throughout our city are, are interested in a local government that is more committed to building homes and providing services that could accommodate a more economically challenged and otherwise diverse population. Affordability is Carter's mantra, so needed in Burlington. I don't envy those starting out in this city where housing is so scarce and home ownership is unattainable for most working families. Carter is committed to this community, the city, and is setting down roots as he and his partner just invested in a home for their family. Carter understands firsthand the challenges for those looking to make Burlington their home. He is committed to addressing many issues in our city, including complex and controversial ones, such as homelessness, safety, and crime. Not to sound too cliche or too old, but he is winding wise and caring beyond his years. Or from personal experience, he is just plain wise and caring. He is willing to dig below the surface to identify root causes and work towards realistic solutions. His advocacy for progressive issues is unwavering and he's committed to principles that promote economic, social, and environmental justice. I am proud to endorse Carter for Ward 1 City Council and honored to be his campaign treasurer. Just the mic, not me. <laughs> okay, I'm Carol Livingston, um, and I live right up the hill with my husband, Gary. So we are very much uh, neighborhood folks, and I uh, love Shemanska Park, and love the barn, and uh, welcome you to, to our space. Um, in the last century, when I was in fr a freshman in college, I came home that first Christmas and told my mother that she was oppressed. I shared with her my new knowledge of the world and concluded that her time at home raising four children had constrained and impeded her personal growth. She laughed at me. I remembered this experience when I met Carter while campaigning for Jack Hansen's run for city council. Carter was Jack's campaign manager, and the two of them had created these amazing maps of wards one and eight with all the streets outlined in varying colors to coordinate volunteers canvassing neighborhoods. At one point, Carter asked me about some political issue, I can't even remember what, and launched into a well-reasoned and researched analysis. I hardly said a word and thought of my mother. Carter is a self-identified political policy geek. Thank God. He is, he is bright and loves to research deeply into issues that matter. He has grown a lot since those days campaigning for Jack and has invested his amazing mind and tireless energy to becoming a leader in our city. He listens and asks questions. He wants to know what others think, and he works to create situations that enable people's voices to be heard. Two years ago, our small Ward 1 NPA steering committee asked Carter to join us. 
The NPA meetings are one of the few opportunities for neighbors to discuss their concerns with one another and with city officials. At these meetings, people can speak for longer than two minutes, and city councilors and school board commissioners can talk with residents. I think Carter has been energized and excited by the NPA meetings, recognizing their importance and potential, and I think this is the kind of leadership he would like to provide more opportunities and honest involvement of constituents in city council decisions. As our friend Jonathan Chapel Sokol reflected about Carter, he has a tremendous amount of lived experience for a young person. He's so bloody honest about it, uh, which informs how he operates in the world. Carter's wisdom, his bright mind, and his heart are keys to his becoming our next Ward 1 city councilor. I introduce, introduce Carter Newbeezer. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> um, I need my laptop because uh, in addition to launching the campaign today, I'm also moving in two days, so I forgot to, <laughs> to print this out. Um, well, thank you, Carol and Cindy, for the really kind words. That was more than generous. Um, and just a quick round of applause for Lisa, who's taking photos in the back, but did a ton of work to get this event together. So thank you. I also want to take a few moments just to thank Councillor Hightower for her two terms, four years of service to our community, um, whether it's just cause eviction, uh, zoning changes to be able to build more housing um, and, and so many issues, making sure that we actually hold UVM accountable, at least push to try to do that uh, through MOU and other uh, means. I've been really, really appreciative to be represented by Zariah um, and I think we're going to lose a lot as a city not having her on the council. So why am I running? I believe strongly that Burlington, our community, is at a crossroads. <laughs> Utility rates, Property taxes and housing costs are out of control. Renters can't afford the basics and in some cases are living in inhumane conditions. Young families can't afford to buy their first home here, secure decent quality childcare, and those who are retired on a fixed income are fearful of losing their homes because of the rising cost of living. Our city's budget is facing large deficits in the coming years and we're at our borrowing capacity and to on top of that, we've lost millions of dollars to lawsuits and the mismanagement of TIF funds. The substance use crisis, houselessness, and mental health challenges are surging. And as Carol alluded to, residents are not adequately informed or included when decisions are being made about our community. Now, these are big challenges, can feel overwhelming. What have some of the responses been from both the city and other political and economic leaders? Well, the city so far, in my view, has failed to adequately enforce existing housing code. We've allowed blight and the abuse of tenants to run rampant. And a resolution that I think, Joe, you introduced um, is sitting in committee. And that resolution would have eased the tax burden on those who aren't making a lot of money. Our state legislature and governor, as we just heard at the last, M last MPA meeting, just kicked 3,000 people out of the housing that they were receiving through the GA emergency housing program in the middle of everything else that's going on. Many of these folks are now ending up on the streets in cities across Vermont, and particularly coming to cities like Burlington. The state has also stopped us from implementing tenant protections like just cause eviction which we all supported overwhelmingly as a community, and have also impeded drug crisis response measures like overdose prevention sites, which we desperately, desperately need. And on top of all these great things, all these great responses, large corporate landlords and corporate interests are donating tens of thousands of dollars. I did some research just looking at the Bissonettes, the Handys, the Pomerloos. They've donated over $30,000 to parties and candidates and PACs to influence elections since 2020. People are struggling 
and the systems of government that we should be able to rely on are failing us. The good news. While these challenges can make us feel overwhelmed and powerless, that couldn't be farther from the truth. These problems didn't fall from the sky. They are a result of human decisions and can be solved through better, more holistic choices. But this change is not going to happen until we, everyone in this room and everybody in neighborhoods across Ward 1 and across Burlington, demand better from our political leaders and those with economic power in our city. As a way to hopefully contribute to that process of demanding better, I am excited to officially announce that I am running for city council in Ward 1. Thank you. We must come together as neighbors around a shared agenda that prioritizes working families, our planet, and those communities too often left behind by the political system. Over the coming weeks, in consultation with neighbors, community stakeholders, and experts, I will be releasing an agenda focused on addressing housing affordability, tax fairness, the climate crisis, substance use disorder, and democracy reform. If we are gonna win this campaign, um, it's no secret I'm not gonna be taking uh, corporate money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna need your, everybody in this room and every, you know, folks outside this room who are supportive, I'm gonna need your help um, to not only win, but then after election day, take some action on these issues and make sure that city government is moving in the right direction. So if you haven't already signed up, um, most of you did because you RSVP'd and marked how you wanted to get involved in the campaign. Um, please go to Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R, -E for BTV spelled out, dot com. And anything you can do, whether it's donating, taking a lawn sign, knocking doors, dear neighbor cards, etc. many of you have been doing it for years now, um, we'll need your help. So thank you all for coming out. Thanks for your support and the kind words. Um, and let's eat some more food. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, let's, that's, a good, that's a good point. I wasn't, but citizen involvement, go for it. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, one of the crises that you mentioned is the uh, crisis of affordable housing. Are some things you have thoughts on that? Let's see. Yeah, I've already started writing up um, the platform, but I just want to make sure it's perfect and well-researched. <laughs> so I'm a bit of perfectionist before we release it. <laughs> yeah, but, but some of the things I think I've been thinking about, we have a ton of really good housing models um, or housing initiatives that date back to the 80s in our city. So thinking about how we can find more money for CHT's shared equity program um, seems really enticing to me because that's a great way that uh, folks with not a lot of money but also first-time home buyers can get into uh, a home that they own. Um, I also want to look aggressively, I think it was you, Herart, back in the day or somebody else who talked a little... Uh, to me about the history at Northgate and the idea of tenant-owned cooperative housing I think is a huge need um, and again that didn't just happen that was because CETA was proactive and went out and dumped staff time into helping residents learn um, how to do that and, and, and holding their hand along the way um, so I think that is really important thinking about how do we have community ownership um, of housing and then the other piece I would say is you know before we pass some grand idea or start some new program, thinking about just, you know, this isn't necessarily the cost of housing, but the quality of rental properties. If we just enforce the code that's on the books, not passing any new code, not changing the penalties, if we just actually enforce what's on the books, that is gonna go miles. And, and we're not close to doing that at this point in the city. Um, and, you know, that's not just my opinion, that's based on folks who have left the current administration who I've spoken to over frustration about that. Um, that's folks, I mean, anybody you've talked to who've rented more than one or two apartments in Burlington um, can tell you some horror stories, and that's just unacceptable. We, we need to be able to enforce existing law. So I think those are some of the things that I'm thinking about housing. And again, even the enforcement, right? We have three attorneys right now, unless they've hired somebody in the last couple months, um, in the city attorney's office for everything the city needs. Um, so that's just, 
you know, not setting up um, those folks for success. Um, so those are some of the ways I think we can, that's a really concrete thing I'm hoping to get done in the first couple years. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Just talking about housing, I want to uh, let you know there's a new player in the affordable housing, um, and that is the Vermont co uh, Real Estate Cooperative. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know about them. It's Matt Crop, right? Well, maybe it's a bunch of us. Okay? Yeah. Uh, but it's a cooperative where people can join and uh, invest money, and it will turn around and buy housing and keep it affordable. And not only keep it affordable, but the renters can be co-op members and if there's extra profits, they would get a share of that. Hmm. So I just want people to know about that. You can <coughs> check it out, just Vermont Real Estate Co-op, just Google that, and go from there. Yeah, yeah, no, I had heard about that. I, I think it's exciting. Um, any sort of, in my mind, any sort of cooperative local ownership um, is both more economically sustainable, but also helping folks build wealth over time. But any other? Yeah. Uh, I'd be interested, Carter, in, in uh, getting your views on how you might deal in the campaign with the public safety issue. Whoever uh, is the Democratic nominee, I expect will will use public safety uh, as a, as a cudgel in the campaign and try to uh, portray the progressives. Uh, as sort of an enemy of public safety. I think that's been done successfully and disreputably in the past, and I think that uh, they may uh, use that same uh, methodology again. Yeah, and I encourage, um, I encourage anybody who's interested in public safety. I thought we just had a really good discussion at the last MPA meeting, Ward 1 MPA meeting, so I'd encourage folks to go check that out. Lacey Smith presented, and it was really, um, it was really informative, and I think gave a really good picture of where things are currently and what are some of the roadblocks that we're hitting. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't claim to be a policy expert. I am a policy geek, self-described. Um, so a couple things. I mean, there are overlapping problems that is contributing to this sense, both real and felt, of uh, the community having sort of lost a step or not feeling safe. The The first thing I would say is, you know, our, so my partner's car and I uh, was sitting unlocked one night and it got rifled through a couple times. I've had, just had my e-bike stolen. That was $1,500 out of the, out of the, um, out of my pocket. Um, my roommates have had their bikes stolen. It's, you know, it's not okay that folks are experiencing that and that is very unsettling and that's wrong in a community. So I don't want to, um, give folks the false impression that that's okay or that uh, they're not right to be frustrated by that. And the question is, how, what are the effective measures that are based on data um, that we can take to actually reduce those instances? So traditionally in our country, and this is a little bit of a generalization, but generally speaking, someone's done a petty crime like that or someone is abusing drugs in public downtown and we could arrest them and put them in jail. The reality is, is that at most, maybe they sit there for a couple months and then they're going to be released. And if we haven't done anything to change their conditions outside of prison or jail, um, it is very likely, and actually there's good studies to show just by going to jail, you're more likely to commit another crime and that crime to be more serious just by the act of entering jail. Um, and I can share those with folks. But if we haven't done anything to change folks' condition which got them into a place of committing those crimes in the first place, whether that's substance use, whether that's they don't have enough money and they're falling out of their housing, um, whatever that might be. Um, it, we're not actually solving the problem. So it's not that it's not an issue or that we should be dismissive of it, but we have to really look at what's actually gonna help that person. So part of that is housing and affordable housing because there's just not enough. Um, part of that is social supports um, whether that's healthcare or just helping people navigate, like <laughs> anytime you interact, I don't know, at least for me, interact with government bureaucracy, um, oftentimes it's incredibly confusing. There's this type of language in some cases, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, trying to navigate that is hard for people 
um, particularly if you're working nonstop, you maybe have a kid at home, et cetera. So I think just navigating these services and connecting people. Um, and the main thing I would focus on, honestly, and the thing that I think I can be most effective on the council um, when it relates to public safety and community safety is addiction. And I know I'm going a little bit around about here, but I think it's important context to hit on first. Um, so I've been sober, as most folks know, for going on five years now. Um, very proud of my sobriety. I grew up in a family that on either side, um, both in immediate and extended, struggled with addiction um, and mental health challenges. Um, and I think most people's family do, um, especially in Vermont. It's a real crisis, um, particularly right now, as we know. Um, so there's a couple things we have to do there. First, we need to stop folks from dying because there are uh, ever increasing number of overdoses to the point where, and Joe, maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong, but the fire department responded to an overdose, I think it was 48 overdoses in 48 hours um, in Burlington in a two day period. Um, so our fire department's doing some incredible work right now, but it, it's not an exaggeration and it's not hyperbole to say folks are literally dying in City Hall Park from this disease. Um, so first thing we have to do is keep them alive and then we keep them live along, long enough to um, get services and hopefully find a detox bed, an inpatient rehab, um, some of these things that we know are really effective in helping folks get sober. Um, that being said, it's not that simple because right now the number of detox beds in Burlington just went down instead of going up. Um, the capacity that we have, number of beds versus the problem and folks looking to use them is completely disproportionate. Um, it's, it's, there's just, any attempt we made, like, you know, we have 35 temporary beds for folks who are uh, houseless right now being put up for the winter. It, it's nothing in compared to the need. It's a drop in the bucket. Um, so, so we need to expand detox beds, inpatient rehab. Medicare only covers two weeks of inpatient rehab. Most people need more time than two weeks to get sober. Um, so I don't know how you solve that problem. We need the federal government to step up. Um, the state has also slow walked funding and support because in their mind, Burlington already gets enough. And why do you need more? Um, but we know that not just folks in Burlington are using these services, folks from outside of Burlington are coming to use these services. Um, and then finally, you know, there's been a lot of talk. I think one of the things that makes people feel unsafe, and I'm rambling a little bit here, but I think it's a long, complex issue. Um, one of the things that people will say, which I experienced with Wally back there, is we went to Edmonds Park and or the Edmonds School, the park in front, the playground. And we walked in after, I think it was Sunday morning, so after like a Saturday night of being in a college town, and there's beer cans in the park where I have a two and a half year old um, and there's a syringe. And like that doesn't feel great <laughs> to be bringing my two and a half year old up and seeing that in the park that we're supposed to go play in. Um, so thinking about things like having an actual team in the city picking up syringes on a regular basis, uh, having overdose prevention sites, which again, the state just said we can't have, the governor in particular. Um, but we need those desperately because they're saving lives. They're getting folks out of just using in random places in the city, um, getting them out of the shadows. And also it's making sure that loose hazardous materials like needles aren't stand, you know, sitting around the city. Um, I think in New York, I'm, I'm keep looking at Joe to fact check me, but in New York, one of the stats was an overdose prevention site that went up, kept 2 million syringes off of, you know, otherwise would have been in public spaces. Um, so I think that's a really critical measure that would do a lot of good and also show folks that we're serious about this problem and that we understand that, you know, having your kid at a public park and seeing those kind of things um, is not okay and no one's acting like it's okay. Um, so anyway, that was a long answer. But I think, you know, getting at addiction is like a huge part of public safety, of both making folks feel safe, decreasing crime, preventing death, um, and I'll say, you know, I'm a sober alcoholic, but uh, folks in recovery are some of the nicest, most genuine people um, that you'll ever meet, and not to 
give myself a huge compliment or something. But, <laughs> but they truly are. And a lot of those folks are working now to help other folks get sober, um, whether it's through a 12-step program, whether it's um, you know, at the Turning Point or the Howard Center or wherever, wherever it might be. Um, they're doing amazing work, and, you know, and they're getting paid nothing to do it. And so they're burning out. Um, and it's hard to actually hire for the position. So I've ranted enough, but it's a, it's a really big, it's a workforce problem, it's a housing problem, it's a services at almost every level problem, it's that the state and feds have no interest in, um, or I shouldn't say no interest, but uh, have not demonstrated that they're taking this problem seriously in Burlington. Um, yeah, so we need to get creative, we need to find uh, more revenue. Um, so I appreciate your, 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 your perspective on systemic thinking. I think it's really important as we're <clears throat> realizing that there's systems upon systems that are crumbling and the solution's not necessarily going to be rebuild those same systems in the place that we're. Um, you, you touched on a point, um, something about uh, some democratic process reforms that you were uh, considering. Is there, is there anything in particular you can uh, mention about that? Yeah, so I think... A few things. Actually, Jonathan just is going to bring something to all wards. Jonathan's on the Jonathan Chapel Sokol's on the MPA steering committee. Um, I think he would, had just drafted something to bring to all wards, talking about um, giving the MPAs more time. I didn't read it all the way through, but essentially giving the MPAs more time to review things before city council are, is passing them and figuring out what are those areas that we can um, make sure that there's real citizen input before we just pass things. Um, and I think that's a huge part of it. I think using the existing MPA structure and figuring out how we can actually, um, how we can make public participation more doable. Can we pay for childcare uh, on a regular basis? We've started doing community meals actually because Sam and, and Joel have been really uh, great about that. Um, so yeah, how do we build more of a sense of community and how do we make sure that uh, decisions get some review by everyday people? The, people who are gonna be affected by the decision, uh, folks in the neighborhood before we pass something. Um, you know, on a personal level, as a, as a counselor, um, I th thought about this before I came here, but I would really like to commit to figuring out a way to, maybe it's a Google form on FPF, something simple, but in the immediate term, when we're posting, if I am elected, if we're posting MPA uh, agendas and like what's gonna go on in the meeting, um, allowing folks to submit questions in advance so that I could come as a representative and actually answer what's on folks' minds directly during that city council speak out um, versus just trying to guess like what's most important. And then I think also on a personal level doing, you know, Jack did these written updates after every council meeting and posted them online into FPF and I am definitely committed to doing those if elected. So that's sort of like public decision making. I do think there's more grand ideas that we'd really have to have a serious conversation about how do you actually implement them. But ideas like participatory budgeting have been done in, in other uh, cities and communities, I think is really attractive because we all have different priorities on how we spend money. So let's actually have a community conversation about how we spend money um, because there are trade-offs to everything we do. Um, the other piece of this, I think it's time to have a serious conversation uh, Money in politics was the first thing that got me jazzed about Bernie um, during his first presidential campaign. Um, it's not about demonizing anybody, but large sums of corporate money being donated to political leadership is not serving the goal of making policy that makes our city more affordable, more livable, more environmentally friendly, less reliant on carbon. Um, so I think we need to have a conversation about <clears throat> about banning corporate contributions in the state, um, a serious conversation about municipal campaign finance reform. There are many cities that take it upon themselves to have a heavier hand in uh, regulating campaign finance. So I think investigating what we could do there. Um, I think lowering the limits on how much politicians and PACs can accept because I don't think, I've never heard someone say the problem with politics is there's too, there's too little money in politics. We need more. Um, so. I think lowering the amount of money in politics is probably a good thing. And then as Cindy well knows, public financing of elections, um, because of uh, Bill Sorrell's pretty partisan actions way back in the day, 
have really put a freeze on people in our state using uh, the public finance system. So it's essentially unusable right now. And afterward, I can go more into detail on that. And Cindy can check if I'm remembering correctly. But, uh, but yeah, making... Yeah. So making running for office actually accessible to everybody and not just those folks who have friends with deep pockets or have deep pockets themselves, I think is, uh, is healthy for democracy um, and probably will produce better outcomes in my view. So ranked choice voting, I'll say some positives because we've done some good stuff too. Ranked choice voting uh, is really exciting. I worked hard with a number of folks on that to get that implemented, um, not being a counselor, but on the outside. Um, Things like all uh, resident voting, allowing everybody to vote if they live here in local elections, I think it's a really positive step forward. Uh, the Secretary of State, I believe, in the last few years um, has gotten translated ballots because we have a ton of new American folks across our state who are coming into, into our community and, and making sure that they're able to vote and it's accessible, I think is important. So not to rant too much, but you asked. <laughs> But any, any other questions? Have you heard enough of me? Okay, well thank you all for coming. Um, I think, yeah, the only ask I have for folks again is if you haven't signed up to volunteer yet, if uh, there's anything that you can do, just Carter4, spelled out, btv.com. Um, this is gonna be a people-powered campaign. I'm relying on all of you uh, to win this, so really appreciate it. Where do we donate, Carter? Um, you can donate on the website as well. They, there will be a donate button up soon that's an online donation platform. For now, it'll go to a page where it shows you the P.O. box. So it's 1411 in Burlington, um, and it can be made out to Carter for City Council. You can send a check. Sweet. Thank you all. So I strongly support Carter Newbeezer for City Council in Ward 1. I've known Carter since he was a UVM student. He has always impressed me as an incredibly bright, committed, and engaged uh, person, uh, going all the way back to his first City Council run uh, when he was still a UVM student. I was just so impressed that he, back then, that he had the just the energy and the desire to become engaged in the community here in Burlington. And since then, he has really matured his uh, views. He's dug deep into many policy issues. And I think Carter is going to bring a really fresh voice for Ward 1 um, to the city council. Uh, Carter is committed to fixing the affordability problems in the city of Burlington, starting with housing, our terrible housing conditions that need greater enforcement. Um, some of the uh, housing conditions are just really um, not fit for human habitation and students in particular uh, are getting uh, taken advantage of by uh, folks taking their rent and not providing um, decent, safe, um, and not affor and affordable housing. Uh, Carter also will be active in helping to support the diversity and diverse new members of our community, including New Americans. I think Carter is also going to uh, work hard uh, to make sure that all of our all the folks in our community feel safe and protected um, in, by, by the Burlington Police Department, um, which right now, many members of our community do not feel uh, that from the police. So um, I know Carter's going to be active in public safety issues. Um, he is in recovery himself, so he will be active on uh, recovery issues, which are part of what are uh, driving some of the petty um, crimes and you know, some of the issues that we're seeing with um, the repercussions of uh, substance use disorder uh, in the city. So overall, I'll just say you know, Carter is a thinking person. Um, he thinks very deeply, looks into things deeply. Um, he researches and formulates um, what I consider to be really good solutions and opinions, and I really look forward to seeing Carter on the City Council representing Ward 1. All right, I'm, I'm happy to cast my vote for uh, Carter for City Council. He's a person with great systemic thinking, <clears throat> and he's able to understand the bigger picture, and he understands how our current systems are working, and what other, current, uh, what other systems can slide into place to replace the ones that frankly aren't working for the city or for a lot of Americans. He's got a great family perspective, 
and he's dedicated to Burlington. So I'm excited to see Carter in City Council. My name is Sarah. Um, I've known Carter for a really long time and I've been really impressed by the way that he's grown um, and all of the knowledge that he's accu accumulated and his commitment to really doing government in a way that actually works for everyone. He's so well researched and I know that he won't be cutting any corners um, in city council. I know that he'll do his part to speak with all community members and really take in um, a real variety of perspectives and I just know that he's well intentioned and I think that's something that we don't always see in politics. We see a lot of people in it for the wrong reasons but um, I'm really picky about who I support. I know a lot of people are in Burlington and I have no doubt that Carter's in it for the right reasons and really cares about Ward 1. So that's why I'm supporting him. My name's Kathy Alwell and I'm a former school commissioner from the East District in Burlington and I'm fully supporting Carter. I've known him for four and a half years, five years maybe now. I love the arrangement, so to say, in the, in the community that he has done over the years. I love his politics. I like what he stands for. He's a real deep thinker and I think He's somebody we really need on the city council, especially for more run. Thank you. Hey, so Josh Ronsky with the Vermont Progressive Party. I'm the executive director here. Um, yeah, we're really excited um, to be launching into town meeting day elections um, here at the Carter Newbiezer city council campaign pick kickoff. We're, I'm neutral until we work our way through our nomination process, but I've been making my way around to all the different um, candidate launches um, just to kind of show support for anyone seeking the progressive nomination in general and I know Carter has been active in the party for a long time so it's always exciting to see anyone who's been active in the party um, jump in and run and our caucus is going to be on December 7th so we're excited that folks are lining up and seeking our nomination and you know we're gonna have a good town meeting day election my name is Milo Grant. I am the city councilor for Central District, and I am very excited about Carter running for city council. I first met him when we served together on the special committee to review policing policies. So I already know him to be someone who is deeply concerned about the public safety issues in our community. And I think he's going to be a very valuable partner on the city council when it comes to addressing those issues. He's also very concerned about issues that are important to working families, middle class families. One of the th most serious things we've never had a serious conversation about is property tax reform and that's going to be really important um, in addition to harm reduction being balanced with um, a quote-unquote law and order approach to our drug crisis and other things so I'm very excited about this candidacy and I hope people consider supporting him thank you hi I'm Samantha Ayat, and I live in the Old East End, and I have known Carter for about a year. Um, my partner, Joel, and I moved to Burlington, and we started getting involved in our local MPA Ward 1 meetings, and just a month ago, I, um, I joined the MPA Steering Committee with Carter, and with that experience, I've gotten to see how much Carter cares about Burlington, and specifically Ward 1, but um, Burlington as a whole. And I know that he will be a great city councilor, and that's why Carter is going to get my vote.